and welcome to our February edition of Voices for the West, a monthly webinar series brought to you by Advocates for the West. My name is Will Shoemaker, and I am Communications and Engagement Director at Advocates for the West. We are a nonprofit, public interest environmental law firm providing free legal services to Native American tribes, concerned citizens, and conservation groups such as the Idaho Conservation League, with whom we have worked in close partnership for the last two decades to protect wildlife and wild places in Idaho. Tonight, we will be discussing the Central Idaho Dark Sky Reserve, how it was formed, and why it is important. We're grateful to be joined by Betsy Mizell, Carol Cole, and Matt Benjamin. And before we dive in, I want to highlight a few things. At the bottom of your screen, you should see the chat section. And so that we can better get to know each other tonight, please take a moment and drop into the chat your favorite location from which to view the night sky. I am typing into the chat right now myself, West Elk Wilderness in Colorado. You will remain on mute throughout the course of tonight's presentations. However, we do welcome your questions. If a question comes to mind at any point during the course of tonight's talks, feel free to drop it in the Q&A section. The Q&A section is also located at the bottom of your screen, but is different from the chat section. We'll cover as many of those questions as time allows toward the end of tonight's webinar. Let's see, Stanley, Idaho, Central Idaho, Harney County, Oregon. Thank you folks for, uh, for sharing some of your favorite places to uh, view the night sky. We are honored to be joined tonight by Matt Benjamin. Matt is currently a member of City Council in Boulder, Colorado, and serves on the board of directors for the Idaho Conservation League. He spent the first part of his career as an astronomer and managed the University of Colorado's Fisk Planetarium for over a decade. Matt. All right, let's share that screen and get started here. Well, thank you, everyone. I uh, want to just appreciate everybody who's here and listening in and uh, here to enjoy uh, a conversational dialogue about uh, the Central Idaho Dark Sky Reserve. Again, my name is Matt Benjamin, um, and I had the privilege of working a part of a really capable team who was just absolutely dedicated to preserving the night skies in Central Idaho. Um, and so it's great to see the success of that reserve and how it has sparked um, really not just imagination, but has sparked a, a motivation among other communities and areas around the country to try to protect their night skies as well for future generations. Um, and so I uh, look forward to having this great dialogue and answering all questions you might have. So what is a dark sky reserve? Well, really like we think of our wilderness or even national parks for that matter, it's an area that we protect um, because of its pristine environment. And in this case, these are areas, these sort of last few bastions of darkness left in the United States, or really globally for that matter. And this dark sky reserve is really intended to protect those environments um, at their core. And so you can see two maps here. Uh, one on the right is a map that shows you just how much light pollution um, exists in the United States. And those color coats show a reference for just how intense the light pollution is. And the image to the left is really the inverse of that or the opposite, which is really sort of showing you um, where those last uh, bubbles of darkness reside in the United States. And so it's really fascinating when you think about there aren't that many places left. And there certainly aren't that many places left that, that really have great access and are also remote at the same, at the same light. Um, it's interesting to note that you know, roughly 80% of the world's population cannot see the Milky Way at night. Um, and that's a pretty daunting thing when you think about our, many of our ancient cultures and indigenous peoples used and were actually intrinsically connected to the movement of the stars and the alignments of the heavens in order to understand the changes of the seasons, when to move, migrate, and all of those in, important aspects of their lives. And yet we've lost touch with that. We've lost a connection to the cosmos. 
it's interesting because it's the only uh, type of pollution that we actually can just flip a switch on. Um, so maybe we should flip that switch and maybe flip it off instead of on. And so I want to maybe touch on it. I may have skipped a slide here. Did it skip? No, sorry about that. Um, I want to touch on a little story um, to give you a reference for how disconnected we are from our night skies. And it has to do with the LA earthquake of 1994. Now I'm dating myself here, uh, but I was 12 years old when this earthquake happened. And I lived in uh, just outside of Los Angeles at the time. And this earthquake was known as I think the Northridge earthquake. It was a 6.7 magnitude earthquake. So for those of you that have been in earthquakes, um, you understand there's a pretty sort of standard routine. Uh, when it shakes, you either get under a table, you find a doorway, or you get outside. Um, because this one struck at 3 a.m., we got on our doorway, waited for the shaking to start. And like everybody else, you move outside, make sure nothing's falling or damaging. And for homeowners, you check your gas lines, check your water, make sure you're safe. Well, so in that routine uh, at 3 a.m., everyone is out in uh, their sleepwear or lack thereof. Um, and the greater LA basin had effectively lost all of its power. Now think about that. If you've ever been to LA or flown into LA, it is a vast expanse of nothing but light. And so to think of that entire basin going dark all of a sudden at the early hours of the morning and having 30 plus million people outside, something interesting occurred. People observed the Milky Way for the first time in many ways in generations. And one of the quirky things about uh, certainly in the 90s when we had landlines is landlines still had power even though the greater electricity went out because of low voltage. So people were still making phone calls. And here Griffith Observatory, what, their phones were ringing off the hook because people didn't know what this strip of cloud was in the sky when in fact they were seeing the Milky Way for the first time. So indeed our connection to the cosmos has been lost, but we have ways to protect what we have. And it's all about location, location, location. So if you're a realtor or understand that sort of old adage about property, conservation and protecting environments are all about those locations. And, and really for the Central Idaho Dark Sky Reserve, this really started about 30 years ago. The ideas started kicking around. Some communities started thinking about how can they protect their dark sky, but it wasn't really until Wild Idaho, which is sort of our annual crowning event for the Idaho Conservation League, which we host at Redfish Lake. In the year 2015, um, I believe I was actually giving a star talk on the, on the water's edge. And we had Steve Batai, Steve Polly, and a number of folks all just sort of congealing around the idea of this is pretty tremendous and we should think about protecting it beyond the protections that are already provided by the national rec area and the national wildernesses that, that, that are surrounding it. And so that's where it really took off. It went from a whispers of an idea into action. And there's no better place to sort of think of those uh, beautiful moments of conservation than Redfish Lake for, for anybody who's been there. And you can see just how wonderful it is over the night sky, over the lake and the sawtooths out in the distance. And so what's really fascinating is striking the balance. And where we protect environments is really critical when you're thinking about anything from a park, national park, national monument, wilderness, rec area. And in the case of a dark sky reserve, location is so important to strike a balance between the remoteness in order to maintain its darkness, but also accessibility. As you saw on that other map, we could have put a dark sky reserve in the Great Basin of Nevada, but there'd be no access, in which case it would be hard for people to have enjoyment and then become those stewards of, of, of the environment that we hoped that they would. And so Central Idaho offered the perfect blending of the two. Now, this was no easy task. In order for us to really develop a dark sky reserve, we had to think about one, where we wanted to do it, but also start doing the stakeholder engagement. And as you can see, it involved four counties, three cities, the US Department of Agriculture involving two national wildernesses and a national rec area, many private landowners and businesses. And overall, when you keep that sandwiched within the Sawtooth National Rec Area, it covers roughly about 906,000 acres. And it was intentional to build the reserve in this exact location, not just for the darkness, but also to leverage the restrictions of both the Sawtooth and the Boulder White Cloud wildernesses because of those intrinsic restrictions that come on development in those areas. So it created a good collar or a donut of protection and meanwhile, um, Highway 75 streaking out from Ketchum up to Stanley offered this perfect corridor 
for people to pepper their way and have their own adventure moving through the core of the reserve and then still having proper amenities and in places where they could enjoy some meals, have a uh, go to a hotel and then either camp or do other great wilderness activities. So it was really the perfect package of an environment, which, which I think coupled to then to building this reserve around that. But some key aspects are needed in order for a dark sky reserve. So when we say darkness, what really do we mean? Well, really, there's, there's a few ways. One, we can measure that. We use a sky quality meter, which is nothing more than really a glorified pager that just stares at the ambient light in the sky. And you get a reading, and, and that reading tells you whether it's dark or not. But more importantly, that's not what people notice. People notice certain aspects of the sky. And one thing in particular is you have to have a very clear and easy view of the Milky Way. And that is no doubt pervasive um, throughout the dark sky reserve um, in central Idaho. And you also need to have a great view of the stars itself, even from some of the cities um, that, that are occupied in the reserve. That image to the right you can see is an image from Ketchum. In fact, it's only a stone's throw away from St. Luke's Hospital. And you get a sense of just the vastness of the stars that are easily accessible in really what is the largest city within the reserve in Ketchum, Idaho. But there's one other object that's really key in order for you to really attain reserve status. And that is certainly for the Northern Hemisphere to be able to see the Andromeda Galaxy. And you can see here in this image taken from the Galena Overlook, um, just as you're coming from Galena Pass and dropping towards Smiley Creek into the Sawtooth Valley, um, this is an image taken uh, you know, early early winter um, at, at night, and you get to see that smudge uh, there in the middle. That is indeed the Andromeda Galaxy. It is the only galaxy you can see from the Northern Hemisphere with your naked eye. And it's really a great threshold indicator for what defines really pristine darkness. And so it's really great to sort of be able to see that. And on the image of the left shows you what a close-up view of that galaxy looks like. And for reference, uh, what's kind of cool is Andromeda is located 2.2 million light years from us. So um, that image we see of it is as it was 2.2 million years ago. Um, thinking about uh, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, we were just barely becoming bipedal as a species. Um, and that's the light we are um, intrinsically staring at now. So having the Andromeda galaxy visible is another key reason or key marker for what uh, constitutes dark skies. I will also highlight that tree sort of down to the bottom there. Many of you know that, that nice sort of rather dead tree off the overlook there but you can see some of the sky glow coming from the Boise area. So we are not perfectly protected, but we uh, have great clear skies, but it does mean that there are some encroachments of lights that may over time um, um, further impact. But having this reserve status gives us leverage to have those conversations with our friends in the Treasure Valley to start thinking about how they can help us mitigate the light pollution that does travel in some cases 50 to over 150 miles to impact sky quality. Now, when we are having our conversations about lifting up a dark sky reserve, um, one thing I, I would bring up frequently is that by having a reserve, you actually can start to create and foster astrotourism. Well, um, some thought, what is that word? And, and, and what is this sorcery you speak of, of astrotourism? But it's a real thing. And it's actually having a great positive benefit in the Sawtooth Valley. Um, I notice a lot of people who are staying there, um, not just enjoying their nights at hotels, but at restaurants, and certainly a lot of the businesses and outdoor outfitters are realizing that people are going there not just for their river trips, for their backpacking trips, but going there also knowing that they're in this great environment with pristine skies and wanting to learn more about it. And so this is a great attractor for people to come and help improve the economic vitality um, in the Sawtooth Valley and the Ketchum and Wood River areas as well. Um, and it's just amazing to get people together who have not seen, looked through a telescope or seen the skies in those great details. And I will say that the Central Idaho Dark Res Sky Reserve was certainly the first, but we intended it to never be the last. And that's a great thing that, that the, when the reserve was established in 2017, we have now seen a follow-on of other reserves in the United States and globally. Um, and particularly in the United States, one such reserve is the Greater Big Bend International Dark Sky Reserve in sort of West Texas, West, Southwest Texas and along the Mexican border. Um, and it's huge. It's the largest one in the world at 9 million acres. Um, and its core actually protects a world famous um, uh, observatory called McDonald Observatory, where a lot of great research occurs. And this one was established in 2022. And then furthermore, there's another one that's uh, on, on the cusp of perhaps getting approved. And that's one a little bit closer to my hometown 
um, in Colorado. And that would be the Sangre de Crisco Dark Sky Reserve, which is um, sandwiched really due west of Pueblo along the Sangre de Cristo Mountains um, and, and really flanked by the Great Sand Dunes National Park. And so another great opportunity for a greater expansion of dark skies and protecting these pristine environments and certainly near population centers where people can certainly enjoy them. And so at a cusp, it's really about how do we protect our dark skies and how do we facilitate a conversation to be good neighbors and thinking about protecting our environment as a whole. And I will just say that none of this would have happened without the instrumental um, knowledge and expertise of the Idaho Conservation League who really thinks of conservation from the groundwater below our feet to the cosmos above us and everything in between. And, and really being the leading voice of conservation in the state of Idaho, um, they were really just the perfect catalyst to really shepherd the dark sky reserve, not just into Idaho, but to get people thinking broadly across the United States about how to protect our dark skies. So hopefully I look forward to some questions for you as we get to the end. Uh, thank you so much. And I think uh, I'll be turning it over um, to Carol or Betsy next. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Matt. Our next presenter is Carol Cole, whose work with the Forest Service, National Park Service, and other nat natural resource organizations includes public outreach, environmental education, volunteer coordination, and community partnerships. Carol is currently president of the Idaho Dark Sky Alliance. Carol. And I think you are on mute. It might be more interesting that way. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. And, and thank you, Matt, for a great overview of, of how we got here and, and where we came from. Um, I'm going to go into a little more detail about how the reserve happened in the details. Um, and where we are now. So that'll give a little bit more information for folks who might be considering um, dark sky places. If it's not going, oh, there we go. So what is a reserve? Um, Matt went into some of that. This is the official um, definition from IDA, but the International Dark Sky Association has been working to address light pollution and preserve dark skies since around 1988. So they're, they've been around for a while and they actually designate several different kinds of, of dark sky places, designate communities, parks, sanctuaries, et, et cetera. Um, right now they have about 200 different dark sky places throughout the world. Um, and there are four places actually in Idaho at this point. Uh, reserve is one, the Central Idaho Dark Sky Reserve. The city of Ketchum is actually a dark sky community. Um, Craters of the Moon is a dark sky park. And just this month, earlier this month, City of Rocks, a state park here in Idaho, became a dark sky park as well. Uh, when we were going through the process, as Matt mentioned, we kind of honed in on the dark sky reserve as the best fit, which seemed like a, a good for the area that we had and what we had going. Um, so this is a list of the current dark sky reserves. Uh, when we were designated, um, there were 12. Now there's about, I think it's about 20, 21 worldwide. Um, I think we joined a pretty cool list of places. If you look at some of the places throughout the world, uh, and, and as I would say, we did a pretty epic road trip, although Obviously, we can't drive to all those places, so we'd have to have other modes of transportation to some, but the idea is still the same. But it's a, a pretty cool list, and, and I think there are some pretty amazing places that I've been to a few, but there are a lot more I'd like to get to. So here's um, one of our favorite maps, although a, a little sad in what it shows. This shows the pollution throughout the U.S. Um, I grew up in Ohio, where you can see there's quite a bit of light over there, but one of those dark places was a farm where it was a little less dark, but so you can still find those nuggets. Really, the core places that we have dark are in the west, and the arrow shows where central Idaho is located, and you can see some other large dark pockets in, in that area, but it's just, it's getting fewer and fewer. So I believe this map was from 2015, I think was the last update one that I saw. 
So it might be a little bit different now. Um, but in that space, in those dark spots, we were in a pretty sweet spot for a dark sky reserve um, in one of those dark pockets. So it was good also, as Matt mentioned, the core areas for the reserve um, were public lands within the Sawtooth National Recreation Area. So that worked out really well. And then also we were in a pretty sweet spot um, because of some work that this is um, being interviewed here is uh, Dr. Steve Pauley. Um, he had been working with the cities and counties within central Idaho since the mid nineties to get a lot of the ordinances in place. So in addition to being a geographic sweet spot, we also kind of had a political sweet spot that all of the communities and the counties had those ordinances in place when um, we started going for designation in about 2015. Um, so that was key. Um, Steve Pauly has been um, involved with dark skies, like I said, since the mid nineties um, and is still involved. He's on our board as well. So he's been actively involved in getting all of the ordinances passed in the area. And he's also worked with Twin Falls and some other places as well to see if we can't extend that out more. So we had this sweet spot and then in 2017, in December, um, we were designated uh, and that was pretty exciting. Uh, there was a lot of effort that came all of those communities in the area and Forest Service and ICL and community um, individuals in the community, businesses. It was really good that we had a lot of that work already done through Dr. Polly and, and other folks up front. Um, and then also it was about a two year process putting in our application. Um, so we were able to reach out to the communities and the schools and other places in that two years to get some education out so that it wasn't just all of us. And in December, 2017, we jumped in and said, ta-da, here's a dark sky reserve. Um, we kind of built some of that understanding and awareness ahead of time. So I think that was key in, in the success as well as some of the other things we've mentioned. So with all of the partners though, I mean, this is, I worked for the first service in the past, so, you know, I have tons of, of files of, of papers, policies and things, but with all of those entities that we worked with, everyone had, you know, their own ordinances and their own policies, pretty similar, but a little bit different for each one. And there was not kind of a central organization that could coordinate those efforts within reserve. So we worked to um, establish we worked to establish a, a MOU. Um, these are all folks who were involved at the time um, between the city and the Forest Service and the county um, to make sure that we had everyone on board. And at that time in 2017, we realized that you know everyone was committed to this. Um, but as we know, in all of those kinds of places, cities, Forest Service, other entities, faces change and, and people change and come and go. So it felt like it was important to establish the MOU just to say, this is what the people who were here at the time intended for the area. And this is what we committed to. Um, of course, you can change any time, but, um, but at least we have that um, to kind of go back to and say, this is what we were thinking. And this is what everyone believed in at the time. And so far, everyone's still on board, even though some of these spaces have changed, um, we still have a, a good presentation there. So in addition to that MOU, and we have that jurisdictional oversight group that we saw, um, later on in 20, Betsy, I think it was 2020, 2021, um, we decided that really what was necessary was some kind of central coordinating body. So we decided to go um, for, dark, or for the Idaho Dark Sky Alliance. Um, to be established as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And that gives us kind of that central, um, central organization or structure to be able to coordinate all of those on the ground things that are happening throughout the various jurisdictions. Um, the, the Alliance has a board. Um, Betsy is on there and, and I'm on there at this point. We have some other folks coming in and going. Um, but it's important, I think, just to have that core group of people who kind of pay attention to what's going on on the ground. Um, with all of those different players, it's important to have some kind of coordination for how we 
just reprint brochures and, and get signs up in the area or whatever when it crosses those jurisdictions. And that's pretty successful. It's also an organization uh, as a nonprofit that we're set up that we can take donations to help uh, further some of those efforts for dark sky efforts that we're, we're doing throughout the reserve. So on to some of the current projects. Um, the first one I'll, I'll touch on came up in 2021 and Dr. Brian Jackson at BSU received a NASA activation grant that included two specific programs that were tied to the reserve. It had some other uh, curriculum efforts and other things too tied to NASA's STEM programs. But two programs here in the reserve. One was the Astronomer uh, Residence. Um, was here for a month last summer. That was our first one. And this year we'll actually have two astronomers coming that were read over kind of mid-June to mid-August. Um, and we'll be doing programs in both the Stanley area and Wood River and throughout the area. And then the other part of that, that of the grant that actually is here in reserve is the BSU AstroTAC student group. Um, it's a group of, you know, kind of changing students year to year, but there's usually five to seven that do school programs and other outreach programming throughout the reserve and throughout Southern Idaho. So that's been really fun. And it's been really fun to work with the younger folks. So that's been exciting. Another part of the grant is uh, funding for UCLA. Um, there's something that came out of the grant that goes to Dr. Travis Longcore at UCLA, and he has brought students um, for two years, and there'll be another group this year coming, and they actually do sky quality monitoring. The photos that you see here are from the sky quality monitor camera, and they show some of what Matt had showed as well. There, If you look on the edge on some of them, you can see just a tiny bit of glow from the Treasure Valley in that area. Um, so that's, they do a lot of other analysis on these that is way beyond what, what I'm able to understand. But um, these are just some pretty cool images. They took, uh, they were here for I think 10 days and they went out four nights taking images and then we're processing them the rest of that time. And exciting for this coming year, in addition to the other students coming this summer, they're also going to have um, a year long position with the PhD student who's going to help coordinate those monitoring efforts here. And monitoring, the sky quality monitoring within the reserve is critical for us to be able to maintain our reserve status within IDA. We have to submit a report and make sure that we're still meeting those sky quality guidelines. So that sky quality part is important. And it really does take you know, someone more like Dr. Longcore or the folks to kind of focus on. Um, another in progress, um, Often that we have going right now, we had a telescope donated in 2021, a really nice one. Um, and we're working to get an observatory established in the Stanley Park. If you've been up to Stanley, if you're familiar with that, it's got a great view of the sky, the night sky over the sawtooth. And we're uh, pulling together some local contractors and other folks to see if we can get a small, not, not the domed um, observatories that you may be used to, but a small roll off roof observatory that will fit in with the buildings that the Stanley Park. So we're hoping that will happen. Cities are moved it. We're just trying to find out how we might get that built now. And one other project that kind of is going on, Matt mentioned this somewhat, and I saw a few folks um, on the, in the chat from Boise area is we, we've known all along that the threat to the reserve is probably not gonna come within the reserve. Uh, you can see in, in this map that there's a lot of lights coming um, from Ketchum, Sun Valley, you know, Thompson Creek Mine was one, Betsy will talk a little bit about that. But really the threat is coming from the Boise area and Treasure Valley. Um, that sur surprising to me, if you can see the pink line is the outline of the reserve and then within that there are two kind of bluish lines and those are the wilderness areas. Well the west side of the sawtooth wilderness is in that purple area which is lighter, more brighter at night than actually sawtooth valley is. Um, so that was a real surprise. This was from when we were doing the application and it was just kind of like wow that's something I would not have expected. But it, it is that over light coming from Boise. So we've actually done three outreach programs in the Treasure Valley this winter. Um, trying to reach some folks there. Um, a couple of our board members actually talked with the Boise mayor 
um, a couple weeks ago just to kind of start that conversation and you know see if there might be something that the Trail Valley can do to help their night sky and also to help um, the night skies reserve as well. So a couple things now this is my background more in outreach and education is what you can do to help get involved. Um, there are some citizen science um, opportunities. One of them is Globe Night. If you're familiar with that, it's a very cool uh, web or, or uh, phone-based program. And it's really simple. You just go out at night during around the full or around the new moon, and you look at a particular constellation and count the number of stars that you can see from where you are. And the expectation is not that everybody comes up to the Saltooth you know, valley or the reserve to do that. It's like, go out your back door, go to your favorite park, go to the state park close to where you live and just count the stars. It all gets fed in and to an international database that shows just how lighting is happening throughout the world. And this is something, it's simple enough that you can do it with school groups or your kids or adults or, or anyone. So I would highly recommend that you look up Globe at Night um, and then the other one is more of just a phone app that you can download onto your phone. It's Dark Sky Meter, similar to what Matt mentioned with the meter that we use to look at sky quality. Um, but it's something you can just put on your phone and you get you know, a pretty good idea of what the quality is for your skies. Then I think, oh, and then another way that you can help out on your own is the um, IDA, National Dark Sky Association, has a very helpful uh, little card that's just the five lighting principles. And you can use this as kind of a survey to check the lights around your house or your community. And just to make sure what you have out there are, as you see, useful, targeted, needed, um, and in the right way, uh, shielded and to the right color. So it's a very helpful, quick little assessment that you can do. Um, and you can even check your neighbor's lights if you want, but you know, that, that might get a little touchy. Um, but IDA on their website has some great ways to contact your neighbors in a nice way. So that's always a great way to get a conversation started. And I just like to leave it with, you know, that we can make a difference. Um, each of us can. Uh, sky, you know, brimming with stars and, and kind of what Matt had said has inspired us through all the ages. Um, humans throughout history have looked up at the night sky and it's just been with awe and curiosity. And it's, it's really provided navigation initially. Um, it spurred scientific endeavors. It inspired artists and poets. Um, so I think light pollution is a real threat to that shared heritage. We know it's a problem and that it's increasing, but light pollution is the only pollution that we can solve at the speed of light. Um, each individual action, individual action whether it's just flipping a switch makes a difference. And working together, I think we all can make some bigger changes on a larger scale that benefit everyone. So I think that's my little call to action there for how we can kind of get more involved. And with that, I'll stop sharing and go back to there. All right, thank you, Carol. As a reminder, if a question comes to mind at any point during the course of tonight's talks, Go ahead and drop it in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many of those questions as time allows toward the end of the webinar. Our next presenter is Betsy Mizell. Betsy is Central Idaho Director for the Idaho Conservation League. For the past nine years, she has worked for ICL in Sun Valley and is very passionate about protection of public lands and our beautiful night sky. Betsy. Hi, thank you so much for having me tonight. My name is Betsy Mizell, and I'm the Central Idaho Director for Idaho Conservation League, and I'm also a board member of the Dark Sky Alliance. Uh, I have to say it's pretty neat to be here tonight to just think about how many years and how long it's been and where we are. You know, Carol here talking about the fact that the Dark Sky Alliance is now its own nonprofit is pretty cool. Because I remember the days in this very office, we would sit here just talking about trying to get a dark sky designation. So it's pretty cool to be now talking about, you know and having other people here tonight from other dark sky potential reserves. So it's pretty neat how time flies. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk about the connection between dark skies and conservation. Also the uniqueness of the Central Idaho Dark Sky Reserve and ICL and unlikely alliances. Just a little bit about ICL. 
ICL is, is an Idaho-based nonprofit. We work on protecting clean air, clean water, special places, wildlife. We do a lot of work in conservation. And luckily, we feel very fortunate to work very closely with Advocates for the West as an amazing partner in conservation work all across the West and specifically in Idaho. So ICL decided to engage in protecting night skies for several reasons. Um, and these are just a couple of them. So to preserve the ecological integrity of natural environments, to protect and preserve cultural sites, practices and cultural heritage related to night sky, protect human health and contribute to energy efficiencies. So something, you know, a lot of us, you know, we always talk about water pollution, air pollution, but night sky and light pollution is pretty, pretty, it's growing and growing. And sometimes we just don't realize what these impacts are. And right now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the impacts to wildlife, plants, and some of our fish species. So luckily in the West, we still have a lot of amazing wildlife species. Uh, we have bison, we have bears, moose, deer, uh, coyotes, wolves, very, a lot of various creatures. And one of the other pieces that is you know, very unique to the West um, and unfortunately kind of sad is uh, as more people are um, moving and populations are growing, uh, we're encroaching more and more into wildlife habitats. So as you can see in this map, we're looking at one of the last wildlife corridors that there's still a lot of communities here, but this is one of the last intact corridors. If you look in this next photo, and as you've seen in like the various slides from both Matt and Carol, this corridor is right here and it's going all the way up into Alaska. And it's some of the last areas in the United States and Canada that still have uh, protect, still have dark skies. And a lot of wildlife really need this for various reasons of to roam, to for habitat, for food, lots of various reasons. And a lot of it's you know based on our rhythm of needing daylight and needing dark nights. Once uh, you know something we don't think about is plants and trees specifically. So lights, um, lights at night are pro are really disturbing urban plants, shifting their buds to open in the spring when their leaves change colors and drop in the fall. So this photo here is actually a photo from Boise and it's taking, uh, it's a tree that's really close to a public light that's on all night. And it's just showing how a lot of the leaves still have not fallen. And based on the closeness and proximity to the light, the leaves are still thinking that they need to keep on blooming and it can actually harm the tree into um, not being able to deal with frost appropriately. Impacts to fish. And so while we are not on the ocean, obviously here where the dark sky reserve is, we do have a lot of amazing waterways. And so artificial light can throw off um, fine tuned nocturnal behaviors such as navigation, hunting patterns, the ability to forage while evading predators. Uh, new research has shown that light pollution can even disturb important survival behaviors during the day. So impacts to salmon. And this is one of the major campaigns for Idaho Conservation League. And I know advocates for the West, it's a big topic for them as well. But artificial light at night along rivers and lakes impacts juvenile salmon. While this is not going to be, you know, the, the thing that's going to create, it's going to fix the whole salmon issue. But, you know, if we were to work with the dams and able to lower some of the light pollution that's happening along them, you know, it would be one thing that would be able to help. It'd be like a, a nice little carrot we could get. So one of the really cool things about, um, the dark sky reserve here in central Idaho. And I think a piece that ICL really likes to talk about is working together. And so this was an amazing collaborative um, that came together. So you have the cities, county, um, IDA, International Dark Sky Alliance, the Forest Service, uh, BLM. You have a lot of amazing partners that came together over the years and really stuck with the process. And some of these partners were used to working together. Some of these partners were not used to working together. And so it was just an amazing way to, you know, kind of build relationships, forward partnerships, and be able to talk about things that we all cared about. Some unlikely alliances here. And this is actually a pretty neat piece to the reserve is, um, and as Matt and Carol had both shown a similar map, here you have Twin Falls and you have Boise, which a lot of the light pollution is coming from. In the center here, you have the Wood River Valley. So you have Haley Ketchum. This is the dark sky reserve area all right here. Up here you have Stanley and right here you have Thompson Creek Mine. So this is the light footprint coming from Thompson Creek Mine. So Idaho Conservation League does 
do a lot of observing of a lot of mining projects. And one thing that we are starting to talk with mining companies is in is talking about their light footprint and noise footprint. And so here's an example of Thompson Creek mine in 2013 to 2016. And this is not all just talking about um, in terms of light pollution, you know, with mining comes like high points and low points and bigger operations and smaller operations. So this is also an example of when Thompson Creek was at a bigger operation to a smaller operation. But here in 2013, you can see that the light footprint is quite large. Same thing over here in 2014. But then if you look at 2016, it had gotten a lot smaller. And so there were several conversations that happened with the mayor of Stanley and some other um, members from Idaho Conservation League and Carol Cole and Dark Sky Alliance um, that they talked with Thompson Creek and talked to them if they would be open to lowering their lights. This is another interesting example of Midas Gold, which is now a different mining company. Um, but here's a dark sky report looking to the stars. And it's just an interesting, you know, talking just unlikely alliances, which is really interesting about how you can really form some interesting relationships and kind of work together on some things while you disagree on other things. And so that's all I have for tonight, but you know, as we've all talked about just how humans are really influencing the nocturnal ecosystems. And uh, the more we are able to work with communities and build other reserves around the nation and in the world, we will really be able to try and combat some light pollution and really help some of our ecosystems and kind of continue some of this natural heritage that we have in all these amazing places. All right. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Matt. We do have time for um, some questions and answers, and we have some questions uh, that have been posed from attendees, including possibly some related ones. So maybe we can kind of piggyback from one question to the next if we need to. The first question is, uh, the oversight group photo showed Dr. Polly, mayors of Ketchum and Sun Valley, but Ketchum and Sun Valley are putting out a lot of light and that poss possibly may be based upon um, the map, one of the maps that we showed that did actually uh, show those communities as kind of bright spots within a darker background. Are the cities just not enforcing their light ordinances? Carol, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, it, you know, in talking with the cities, uh, I get some questions through the Idaho Dark Sky email or the website, and people do ask about that. You know, they ask about their their neighbors' lights or some of the city lights, and all of the cities and the county still and probably will for the while. They are they, they respond to complaints. Their their compliance checks are mostly complaint based. Um, they don't have people on staff who are you know they don't have a dark sky specialist on staff um, who can go out and check all the lights and and do all of that. So really, a lot of it is complaint based. They do all have um, amazing, I think, pretty good uh, ordinances, and and they enforce them you know as they can. Um, but I think if they're if you know the particular lights or some of that, then it's it's a good thing to talk with them. Um, as an aside, I guess a little bit, I'll go a bit um, at the Duck Sky or at the Solstice event in December. I talked with Ketchum Mayor and just was talking about all of the holiday lights along Main Street. And holiday lights aren't a huge concern for um, dark sky and light pollution. It can be during those holidays, but they go away typically. But we talked with him about just the color of the lights that they have. They have all of the white lights, millions of lights, I'm guessing, on those trees. And we just talked with him about looking at a different color of light, like a warmer color of white that's a little more um, orange yellowish. And you know, he just didn't think about that. And obviously, they can't replace all of their lights at once, but he committed, and I'm going to hold him to it, to changing out one block of lights um, next year when they put the lights up. And just to have that as a comparison, and I offered at the same time to provide some educational signs that we can put up to explain that so that people can look at their own lighting as well. And not just for holiday lights, but it really highlights that um, idea of the color of lights that you use. So, um, so there are, we are making some progress. 
related to that, and I am going to uh, provide a little addition to this question myself. Um, the question is, how can we get our city government enthused to remind citizens of our already in place regulations? In addition to our city governments, how might we in a neighborly way go about this? Let's say, you know, in, in the sense of, of um, reminding or, or educating our neighbors about um, some of the regulations that are in place. I could maybe take a stab where, and I could put my city councilor hat on for a moment, you know, and it kind of piggybacks on what, what Carol was saying, you know, code enforcement is, is really, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones that have to engage in that. And I will say that every city, whether it's Boulder, Colorado or Ketchum was dealing with um, budget cuts, furloughs and cuts to staff. And a lot of times it's those enforcement folks and those in the planning departments that that took the brunt of it. And, and many cities are still struggling to get those hirings back. So there is some lag in terms of really building back that enforcement capacity um, on a lot of different ordinances for every city. But one of the big things that I remember we we touched on in early on in our process was one of, one of the complaints we got when we were starting this was the light police. Oh my gosh, the, the, well, the light police are gonna show up and tell us we can't use our snowmobiles or anything like that. And what we really settled on was, was this was mostly about accountability to one's neighbors and thinking about light trespass. And much like if your neighbor's trash blew into your yard, you'd kindly ask them to pick it up. And if their light is shining into your property, you'd kindly ask them to not do that anymore. And so I think part of the education is being able to have that neighborly communication. And I know, I know for sure that because of COVID, we are all more insular than we were prior to that. And we are a little bit more hermited than we once were. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to have that greater dialogue with our community. But, but local governments do play a role to lift that up, provide that education, but also make sure that that dialogue is regular, that we can hold ourselves accountable and do have those communications and conversations with our neighbors. Those are often the best way that before just filing an anonymous complaint about someone being non-compliant, have that dialogue. I think we, we find people being more accommodating than they are not. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, this next question relates- uh, I will, I think Carol had her hand up. She wanted to- Yeah, let me, let me share one thing that Blaine County just sent out. I'm not sure how this is gonna work. I have it in a Word document. Um, but Blaine, Blaine County just sent this out in the last month um, to folks. And this specifically talks about holiday lighting, but I think just to show that, you know, the cities and Blaine County and other places are taking you know, kind of a proactive effort to, to share the dark sky ordinance information with folks. So I think that's critical as well. Um, you know, it's not that they put something out every week, they try to just remind folks or put out, they all have brochures available too that provide information. All right, thank you, Carol. Um, I know you spoke about this uh, within your presentation, there was a slide about it. Um, this question is, is about plans for the observatory in Stanley's Park. Um, can you provide perhaps a little bit more detail on, on uh, where that project stands? Well, I'll first say it's not standing right now. Um, we're not there yet, um, but we're hoping to do that. We had talked with a company that provides the roll-off observatories, like you saw um, prior to COVID, what was that, like three years ago? All that gets a little mixed up. Um, but, and they have since kind of reformatted their focus to only be doing things in Ohio. So that was where they actually would come out and put those structures up and we were kind of moving in that direction. Um, and that changed. So now we are looking for some plans, some companies that have plans for those roll-off observatories. And then we'll just work with local um, contractors to try to do that. The city of Stanley has already approved concept and we tromped around out there in the snow a couple of years ago and found a place that was a really good location for it. Um, so the city I think is ready to see what our final plans would be, but it's just trying to pull some of that together now. For the next question, uh, Betsy touched on this. Is there any coordination with groups to limit noise along with light? Uh, maybe regional airports and the FAA noise, particularly industrial noise, like air and automobile traffic are frequently intrusions into uh, escaping the rush of modern society. 
I can just touch on the piece just that I know that ICL does. And then I don't know if Carol can talk a little bit about some how sometimes the Forest Service looks at talks about noise or airplanes or things like that. I mean, it's it's hard, it's hard, I think. But um, similar to how ICL is, you know, kind of talking with different um, unlikely alliances. Uh, as we are talking with people about night sky and what they can do about lowering their light footprint, we are talking about noise. Um, so sometimes these mining projects, you know, have been surrounded by various cloths to protect noise and things like that. Um, you know, wind turbines, various things. Um, I'm not the expert here, so I can't totally speak to how detailed we get in some of that, but I do know it is a topic that we are using in a lot of um, various proposals and things like that. Okay, thank you, Betsy. Um, for the next question, I'm wondering if Dr. Polly had a systematic way to address local government light, lighting ordinances and encourage changes to meet dark sky IDA requirements. Carol, you want to go? I, I've got a good bit to share about Steve, about Dr. Polly as well. You could probably add too. Um, um, my only effort would be to say he was persistent, but I'll let you know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that was the word I was going to use. I, to connect it to sort of one of I, ICL's main mantras, it's endless pressure, endlessly alive. I mean, he was just banging down the door all the time. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and he was great at it, but he came at it with also understanding that he, he, he couldn't demand instant change and he was thinking about the long game. And so building those relationships and realizing that in order for this to have staying power, he got to do the work up front to build that foundation for those ordinances and for those changes to actually last a long time. If you come in with a flash in the pan, they get removed as quickly as they get implemented. And he, and he, he had the savvy to know that, um, even though deep down he wanted them to happen yesterday, I, he understood the long game and, and played, that, uh, played that really well. And, and I think, you know, was successful at that for sure. To piggyback on that a little bit, you mentioned relationships, um, Matt. You know, for for folks that are with us tonight that that are interested in preserve that are per interested in pursuing or are pursuing um, reserve status or or some other uh, protective status um, in other parts of the West, is there any other advice that you might give to them? I mean, I, I mean, since I, I mean, I'll just answer as that was directed at me, but I'm sure Carol and Betsy have thoughts on this as well, since they've, they've, we've all sort of had it from different angles. Um, I think the, one of the first things to do is is reach out to the International Dark Sky Association. I think if you if you're interested, they are they are the experts. They are the, they are ground zero for all of this, um, and and I think they have this amazing playbook, really that allows you to sort of build that scaffolding, as I sort of mentioned. Steve Polly was kind of just doing it in a vacuum to some extent. I mean, he, he, he knew what IDA was doing, but he, he had his own brand of it. But, but the scaffolding that IDA really focuses on, I think, is, is, is tremendous. We leverage that a lot. Um, but, it's, but it's starting with you know, elected officials, those stakeholders. The, the, your local chamber of commerce is a great place to start. And if you have any wilderness or any forest service that you're, uh, or any of those national agencies, start those conversations early. Because I'll tell you, trying to modify the, the Forest Service handbook is trying to chisel new lines in Moses's tablets. So, I, I mean, it's hard to get them to change their handbook, but you take time and you build the case and you do so. So, so have that long game and, and build those relationships, areas that people have stakeholders uh, for businesses and homes and those sorts of things. Uh, you know, those, th that's where I would start. And then you'll start to congeal so interested stakeholders. And then that's really where it takes off is when you have a few people in each of those groups that have a unified direction, and then it sort of catches wind and, and goes. Carol or Betsy, anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, I would add and think on what, what Matt said. I think it really is having those relationships built up front. Um, and that was what I think helped with us is there was already some collaborative efforts happening within the Salted Valley and Salty National Recreation Area with the Forest Service and the communities that really helped with some of that. Um, there was some questions initially in the Forest Service. I still worked with the Forest Service when we were going through this. We had a lot of questions, you know, from the regional office and even the Washington office because it was the first large scale Forest Service area. Um, there was another place, I'm trying to think now where it was, if it was in Michigan or somewhere, that they were working toward adding. Um, 
in their NEPA reviews, adding the night sky as a resource that would be considered and reviewed. And they came, you know, they got that into their uh, NEPA process, which was huge. Uh, but that's not happening everywhere. And, you know, you have to write people in, in place. But really it is, you know, taking those small steps. I think having a broad base, people say, well, how can I do this? And, you know, I say, well, who do you know? Who do you know in, you know, that's a nurse or a doctor that can come from, can come at it from the human health issue? Uh, who do you know that's an Audubon member and can talk about bird migration and, you know, the impacts there? And I think you you build that bigger audience or that bigger chorus who can then talk with the city officials or county officials. Um, they're not going to listen, you know, necessarily to IDA or to us when we go to the Treasure Valley because we don't live in the Treasure Valley, but it really needs to be that um, local base that's, that's uh, taking that up to the uh, cities and counties. Betsy, is there anything you would like to add to that? Okay. No, I think both Matt and Carol covered it. Um, a question from one of our attendees. Um, they love the Blaine County flyer. Um, is that something that uh, we would be willing to share? Well, I live in the county, so I guess I can send it out. Um, but I, I think it's on, I'm, you know, I'd have to see if it's on the county website or not, but I can certainly check with Christine and see if that's something, I mean, certainly I can send you a screenshot of it and you can make up your own for, for wherever you are. But, um, and again, that one addressed mostly the holiday lighting, but it, I just think it was a good example of reaching out to the community. So I will check on that. So we, we talked, about light pollution um, and the impact of light pollution on our daily lives. What physical impacts on the human body does light pollution have? Who wants that one? I, I, I can take that. Um, sure. Um, so one of the things, and this goes back to my time when I was um, in my days doing astronomy at the University of Colorado Boulder in the planetarium was we, we were working uh, with a number of folks who were dealing with light pollution from a, from a bunch of different facets. And, and from the medical side, what I found really fascinating in some programs we were developing at the university was um, really centered around sleep and how having a lot of brighter white lights around at night, be it outside or even inside your house, disrupted um, the production of melatonin in your brain. And melatonin is key to helping you develop those sleep habits. And what was happening is, is, is that when you wake up in the day, that blue light in the sky, I mean, we're literally, I mean, talk about being the products of, of star stuff. You know, the, 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 the fact that we have this interesting chemical composition that is unique to our planet scatters the light preferentially to blue colors. And then our bodies have evolved that when we no longer see that bluish light in the sky, our bodies kick up the production of melatonin to help us sleep. I mean, it's just a fantastic uh, uh, story of just the evolutionary products in, our, uh, in how things have occurred with our bodies and, and the biology. And so when you have those artificial lights at night, you're suppressing the production of melatonin um, directly. And so it's really messed up sleep habits. And then, we are, and then there's a lot of research that says if you're not getting good sleep, it has a lot of rippling health effects that come from that. So that was one of the interesting real things of not just the outdoor lighting. As we converted to LEDs, a lot of people were putting those bright white LEDs in their house. And then those were the things that they were reading with. Or when you're looking at your phone, you're looking at this bright illuminated screen. So a lot of those lights as they encroached inside were having those negative impacts. So, so the outdoor lighting, indoor lighting are all connected because of the newer technology of LED bulbs. Um, and so as Carol was bringing out, pointed out, the color and the brightness temperature of the light you use is so fundamental to maintaining good illumination while not creating those dangerous and hazardous impacts with regards to melatonin production in your brain. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, we are out of time and need to wrap up this evening's webinar. Thank you, Betsy, Carol, and Matt for inspiring us to cherish and protect the dark sky experience. And thank you to our attendees uh, for your thoughtful questions this evening. 
important conservation work that groups like Advocates for the West, the Idaho Conservation League, and Idaho Dark Sky Alliance is doing is only made possible thanks to supporters like you who are with us tonight. If you feel inspired, we hope you will give a gift to help us continue this important work. I will be sending a follow-up email to attendees, including a link to the recording of tonight's webinar on YouTube. Please feel free to share it uh, with folks who you think might be interested in uh, our work and the topic of, of tonight's presentations. We hope you will join us again on March 29th for our next Voices for the West webinar. We will be taking a step back in time to the origin and early years of Advocates for the West in celebration of our, of our 20th anniversary this year. Stay tuned for more details in the weeks ahead. With that, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you all.